All right. Hello, everyone. So June is both Pride Month and National Indigenous History Month. So before we begin, I acknowledge that Surrey Archives is situated on the unceded and ancestral lands of the Salish peoples, including the Keetsi, Kwantlen, and Semiami nations. Welcome to Surrey's LGBTQ2S plus history. Surrey Archives' mission is to keep the memories of our communities alive and to increase our understanding of each other. Uh, tonight, we will be doing just that. So as previously mentioned, this program is being recorded as an interactive oral history which will be preserved as a historical record in the archives collection for future generations. My name is Stacey Gilkinson. I'm the assistant archivist for Surrey Archives. My pronouns are she and her, and I'll be ch or chairing tonight's panel discussion. We are very fortunate this evening to be joined by three longstanding leaders in Surrey's LGBTQ2S plus community. And I'm going to now ask each of you to briefly introduce yourselves to our audience. Uh, starting with Jen. Thank you, Stacey. My name is Jen Marchbank. I am a professor of gender, sexuality and women's studies at Simon Fraser University based out of the Surrey campus. I've been a Surrey resident since I came to Canada in 2005. My work has included a lot of um, intergenerational work with both um, LGBTQ2S youth and LGBTQ2S elders. Um, and my wife and I co-founded and now co-facilitate the Youth Activist Group, Youth for a Change, which is now 10 years old. Stacey, I forgot to say certain things, so my pronouns are she and her. Um, I am a past president. I spent two um, years as president of Surrey Pride and Martin managed to recruit me back this year to become secretary. Hi, my name is Alex Sanga. My Indian name is actually Amr, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. I am the founder of Share Vancouver, which is now a registered charity for queer South Asians and their friends and families. We actually welcome everyone. We are celebrating our 15th year next year. I'm also a documentary film producer and a counselor. Um, we produced uh, uh, two films in Share Vancouver. Our first film, My Name Was January, was about our social coordinator, January Marie Lapuz, who was murdered. Uh, she was stabbed 18 times and she died in New Westminster in 2012. So we made a memorial and a eulogy about her, which went around the world at film festivals. Our debut feature film, Emergence Out of the Shadows, which you will see the trailer for a little bit later, um, is about the coming out journey of gay and lesbian, queer, Punjabi Sikh people and the reactions of their parents. And the film is also uh, doing very well and will be broadcast on television, is doing well on film festivals. And, you know, we are trying our best to um, educate our community and create awareness about some of the struggles and issues and strengths that we go through. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Alex. And now you, Martin. My name is Martin Rooney. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am attributed as the founder of Surrey Pride. Myself, my partner, and two lesbians uh, started the first dance in Surrey in 1998. Um, and I'm now the current president of the Surrey Pride Society, celebrating its 23rd anniversary festival on June 25th. Um, there's a lot of history that has gone on. Um, so I'm open to hearing any questions so that we can develop uh, a historical, factual uh, history of gay surrey. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, so before we dive into the discussion, uh, I want to remind all of you attending in the audience that audience participation is at the core of tonight's program. So if you have a question for our panelists, please submit it through the chat function. So as you think about the questions that you would like to ask, we're going to start things off with our first question of the evening. And so the first question is, what was your personal experience living in Surrey as someone who identifies under the LGBTQ2S plus umbrella? And how has that experience changed over time? Uh, Martin, would you like to start us off tonight? I moved out to Surrey in 1996 when it was not okay to be gay. 
Um, there was no gay community. There was no um, way of interconnecting with, with people of the same ilk. Um, so from that perspective, um, I was challenged that you couldn't have a gay dance in Surrey. And so you don't, you know, give me a challenge and I'll take it on. So in, in 1998, we had the first open gay dance in Surrey. At that time, um, the school trustees had banned three, what they determined to be three gay themed books. So the biggest banned books defense fund was started to take it to the Supreme Court. Our first dance was uh, April, uh, was uh, Valentine's Day, 1998. It was a fundraiser, the first official fundraiser for the biggest banned books defense fund. And Mayor McCollum was the mayor at the time. So here we are 25 years later uh, with a similar mayor. And um, as, far as, as far as the community goes, it has grown. It has also um, pulled back because of the current political situation that we have. And I don't know if that answers the question that you asked, but um, if you need further clarification, please feel free to um, follow up. Uh, Jen, I see your hand. So as I said earlier, I moved to Surrey in 2005, having been living in the States in that brief period back in Scotland. And I came as an open lesbian. And one of the first things that was said to me was, you're a lesbian. You're going to live in Surrey. Why? So even in 2005, that redneck reputation was very much there. It was, I was, you know, my colleagues looked at me as if I was like mad. And I said, well, I'm going to be working in this city, therefore um, I'm going to stick with it. Um, at first, but I would still have this issue today. Back in 2005 and today in 2022, there is nowhere in this city you can go to to say, where can I find the gays or the trans or the non-binary? We don't have that still. Uh, this is something that Martin and I have been, we have organisations, the organisations are really active. But there's no, if you were a baby gay coming to town or a new person in town and you were coming in and you say, where would I go to find this? You'd have to already be somehow connected. The um, websites are brilliant. At least you can go look and Google and find organisations and say, oh, Sherry Vancouver's running that event. I want to go and watch that movie. Um, things like that can happen. Um, but. The, my experience has changed greatly over time because at first I was just coming in um, as a single mom, just trying to find my feet here in Surrey and how that experience has changed. I wasn't nearly as busy then. Trying to run pride festivals takes up huge chunks of your life as does running a weekly youth group. So my experience has changed greatly as in my workload has increased. But it's been good because I've got some fantastic relationships, including with archives. Oh, thank you, Jen. Alex. So I have lived in Syria and North Delta pretty much my whole life. I grew up in Newton, even though I live in North Delta now. In grade eight, we moved from North Delta to Syria. I went to Frankfurt Secondary in Newton. That was in 1985 or 1986, I believe. And at that time, Newton was sort of a a community in transition, its demographics were changing from predominantly working class and poor Caucasian community to a mixed community, which is now predominantly uh, Punjabi Sikh and South Asian. So the high school that I went to was very much racially tense. And I was trying to fit in as a gay closeted young grade eight kid. And there was no cell phones back then. There was no internet. There was no gay straight alliances. There was uh, no youth for a change, no share Vancouver, no Surrey pride. There was nothing. And even a lot of the principals and the teachers, um, you would never approach them because a lot of them, you know, how would, how would a young kid know that, you know, the teachers are any different than um, all the other homophobic people that you're dealing with at that school? There was no rainbow stickers or rainbow crosswalks or, you know, even the rainbow flag, which Martin and Jan and, all, and the community is advocating for to, to be raised. I mean, it sends a powerful message to kids in the community and to everyone in the community that this is a welcoming space and a safe space. 
And uh, then what happened was in 2008, um, well, actually just before that, I believe there was a young man who went to a high school in Surrey. He was in a suicide note. He wrote that he was straight, but he was so bullied at school. He went to a high school in Surrey. He was called queer, faggot, homo, every single day that he couldn't, he couldn't tolerate it. He went and walked to the top of the Patola Bridge and the next morning they found his body at the bottom of the river and he died. And this was a true story that happened and it really hit me hard because this kid was originally um, from Afghanistan, you know, South, a you know, kind of close to South Asia and South Asian and some people might say, and I really felt for that because I felt I felt the same bullying and racism and pain growing up as a gay kid feeling different. And I dealt with a lot of internalized homophobia and a lot of internalized racism. Finally, when I felt good about myself, I started Sherry Vancouver in 2008. And you know what happened? The moment I started Sherry Vancouver, the leader of the Sikh temple in Surrey said, there's no such thing as gay Sikhs. All of a sudden I'm getting bashed by people on MSN from around the world. And that was the beginning of my real advocacy in 2008. Well, thank you, Alex. And it's clear from your new movie as well, Emergence Out of the Shadows, that we'll be advertising at the end of tonight's program, how important those resources are. Um, Martin, I saw that your hand was up briefly. Could you have something to add? Yeah, I can relate to Alex's experience. I mean, I was born and raised in Southern Ireland, which was a Roman Catholic nation at the time. And we were bullied. Um, we had apparently white privilege, but even inside of all of that, um, being gay was not an acceptable thing in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, so, so I lived under, quote, colonialism, unquote and was subject to an imperial empire of religion. And, and when I, I moved out of Ireland because I couldn't handle um, being gay in Ireland and, and Canada accepted me as an openly gay person back in 1986, I immigrated to Canada. I became a Canadian citizen in 1991. Um, and, and what I've noticed, um, as I said before, we went into the public meeting, um, 25 years ago, it was um, it was white Christian right um, that was 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 controlling the dialogue, and as Alex explained, um, the demographic has changed. But I'm not so sure that religion doesn't play uh, a role in people jumping off a bridge. Uh, I I I had thought about suicide as a kid. Um, but being Catholic, it was immediately hell, <laughs> and I wasn't willing to go there. Um, so, so I was I was raised to. I'm the eldest of five, and I was raised to be um, strong, and in all of that sort of stuff. So it became very difficult to live in Ireland. So I moved to Canada and and moved to Vancouver, and it was incredible at the time in Vancouver. But then moving out to Surrey brought back all that PTSD when there was no open gay community in our city and in 1996. And, and, and as Alex said, where would you go? There was no Surrey Pride. There was no Share of Vancouver. There was no Empire of the Peace Arch Monarchist Association. And there was no community. Um, however, at the same time, I will say that I don't think we were discriminated against. I think we were more a, uh, a, a poster um, uh, for people to to pour pity on, and, and pity is not what we needed at the time. We needed a sense of um, you have every right to exist, just like the rest of us, and and as a human being, you're equal to everybody else. Anyway, before I go too far further on all that, I just wanted to support Alex's um, um, view of society because I experienced the same thing as 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 a white, supposedly Christian. Thank you, Martin, and we'll be touching on that theme again later on in the panel discussion. I do want to turn our attention now to the chat. There was a question um, that came through just as you were speaking, Martin, about the uh, School District 36 book banning. Um, and Jen, you did answer a little bit here, but would you be able to expound on that? 
OK, so the book banning was when James Chamberlain asked Surrey School District to approve three books he wanted to take into kindergarten and grade one as a kindergarten teacher. Um, the school district got some complaints from parents and said, no, these books can't come in. It, as Martin has already alluded to, there was a support fund that was taken all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. And at that point, the judge ruled, and I quote, that tolerance is always age appropriate. The banning of the books was um, uh, was overturned because the, can the schools acts of Canada say schools have to be secular and therefore um, allowing the demands of some Christian families meant that the school space was no longer secular. So then the school board said, um, so a little bit of background for me, I'm a political scientist, I write about uh, my, I've written in the past about things that, sh equality issues that should get happen but are covertly, not outrightly sold, no, but covertly kept off the agenda. This is exactly what SD36 did. They turned around and said, that, um, OK, we'll accept some books, not these books, because these books have poor grammar. Um, and so they, they were never in the school system. And, I, you know, it's difficult to find out what books were actually allowed in the school system. Interestingly, a member of that school board at the time is still was re-elected, not last time, but the time before, to our current school board. Um, so we still have a member of that school board. His name is Gary Timoshuk. Um, I don't think he's banning books anymore, but it was interesting that that history has repeated itself as well. Um, we we're trying to find the books in the Surrey Library system last week. They're not there. Alex, did you have something to add? I just also want to point out that Surrey Libraries went through all this banning as well. Um, their chief librarian was very supportive of um, uh, gay and lesbian content in uh, Surrey at that time and uh, Extra West came under fire in the, the Surrey libraries. Um, they did not want to make it accessible or for the gay community to have access to that. And um, um, I remember that and, the, uh, you know, they eventually ended up keeping it, but it was a big, big sort of internal fight to my knowledge of what Surrey went through at that time. And Martin, yes. Okay, so sorry, am I on now? Okay, so what I understood from all of this was that an element of the right wing Christian community decided that these books were same sex promoting books. However, I think Alex will agree with me that a lot of South Asian families have the grandmother and the mother raising the children while the males go out to work. So how you can create a gay or lesbian relationship out of that astounded me. And, and you also have the scenario where, where two men, regardless of whether they were together or not, could end up raising children. So there was an extreme interpretation of these books when they hit the market that suited a political agenda at that time. I'm not so sure much has changed about that. But, um, you know, when you look back on history and you look back to 25 or 26 years ago, um, the interpretation of, quote, the Bible or, quote, books or, quote, the intent of the author has been manipulated by a certain political wing um, to, to designate and the minority or marginalized community as pedophiles. And, and so to me, um, I didn't understand that 25 years ago, but looking at the whole scenario now with the way that families raise children and the fact that, you know, certain um, um, communities in the world have a different outlook on how kids be raised and how families are constructed, I think back then it was a, a, a total attack from the extreme right relevant to how reality really was. And Jen, do you have another thought to add? Yes, I do. I just um, want to ensure that people understand that Surrey libraries do have a diversity librarian. 
and um, I personally have been involved in um, several events and partnerships with Surrey Libraries. Um, they've always been since 2012. So um, we're, I know that before COVID hit, Surrey Libraries had my exhibit from my Beyond 1969 Oral History Project touring for the whole summer. Um, and COVID killed off that tour, but I've had excellent partnerships putting in LGBTQ2S um, services and materials into the libraries. Oh, thank you, Jen. That's an important note. Um, I would also like to add as we wrap up the conversation about the book ban, uh, that it was extensively covered in the Surrey Leader newspaper, and many of those newspapers are now housed and preserved at Surrey Archives. So if you are interested in learning more, please do get in touch with us at archives um, at surrey.ca and we can help you out with that. All right, I'm going to move into another question here and we touched on this somewhat, but I think we could go a lot more in depth, I'm sure. What are some of the firsts that you have witnessed in the context of Surrey's LGBTQ2S plus community? Uh, what barriers have you seen broken in your time in Surrey and what barriers still exist? Uh, I think I saw Martin's hand go up first. There we go. Uh, I'm sure Jen will follow up with, uh, on what I'm about to say. So the barriers that existed in, in 1996, 97, 98 was the structure of the city and the fact that it was majoritively um, right wing Christian or that's how it was perceived. Um, I'm sorry, I missed the second half of that question. Sure, the second half is what barriers have you seen broken in your time here and what barriers still exist? Oh, well, the barriers that were broken was that there's an open LGBTQS two-spirit community in Surrey. Um, as I as I said in, in, in before and many times in public, and particularly when I ran for City Hall in, in 2014, very little has changed. Um, McCollum was mayor back in 1998, 1990, or whenever we started. He's mayor again. Uh, he had a right-wing council. Back then, he has what I perceive to be a right-wing council right now. So even though we lifted a lot of barriers, um, and Jen can confirm this, we've reached out to many organizations and particularly businesses in this city to establish a pl safe place for the LGBTQ community to host drive shows, host bingos, host whatever. And every time we've gone into a space that we've been supposedly welcomed in, um, that business, once it regained its power, um, has shoved us aside. So 25 years ago, we had dancers at Sullivan Hall. They were exclusively advertised as LGBTQ. We've had multiple spaces in the city over those 25 years, but we've been shifted out of them. and and. The one thing that I have wanted and we're in the process of trying to organize right now is to have an LGBTQ center somewhere in Surrey, um, preferably downtown as in Wally with satellites throughout the city. Um, there is no resource for LGBTQ people as Jen um, mentioned before, if they come into town and can suddenly go, oh, I have a safe space to go whether you want to go to a bar, whether you want to go to a club, whether you want to go to a center to seek um, advice on um, resources that are available. The only resources that are available currently are the ones that the websites belonging to the organizations that, that um, claim to represent the community um, exist. So 25 years later, quite frankly, um, we're back to where we started and, and, and you know, it's difficult to have looked. Ask me 25 years ago if I thought we would be open and gay in Surrey. My answer would have been no. 25 years later, we've been open and gay in Surrey, and we've been blocked at every level of, you know, participation that that to this point. Um, we're in dialogue now with the Surrey Board of Trade, with the Downtown Business Association, other organizations, 
to try and elevate the LGBTQ community to equality status. And as long as the city does not fly the flag, the pride flag, that is, um, it doesn't show any open welcoming to any LGBTQ business or organization to be other than inside the community to exist. Thank you, Martin. And Jen, you have your hand up. Yes, I'd like to talk about some significant firsts and one that might not be so well known about um, by even members of the LGBT community here. Um, a few years ago, I, I have graduate students every year. I look for them to have real world research projects to do. And I got a commission from the settlement agency Diversity in Newton. And that commission was to map out what services that exist in Surrey um, for LGBTQ and what services exist for newcomers and to see if there were any newcomer specific services. I knew I could give the answer straight away. I said there are none. But we diligently went, my students diligently went through a process of mixed method research and did an asset map and showed that there were none, but yet, you know, all these different communities exist. And uh, diversity took that to their board of directors and the board of directors said, you've identified a gap and there is, and they then put together a pilot. And so there is now um, within diversity, there is a group called Better Together for LGBTQ newcomers and refugees. So I think that's a significant first. Um, Stacey, you have that report. That report is in the City of Surrey archives. It's called Mapping LGBTQ Newcomer Services. Um, so that's one thing that I think is um, great. Um, something I've witnessed that's not so much um, a first because the flag has never flown, but Martin and I, every time we go to the go to council and ask for the flag, we have an additional ask. And this is something people might want to consider as activists. First year, Martin and I did a delegation to council. We knew the flag was not going to fly, but we thought we we're going to make the political point of asking. And then I had a secondary ask. I said, could we also have a history display in City Hall Atrium? And Martin and I put that first one together years ago. And since then, I and, until COVID hit, the very last one was in there in 2019. And it was focused on um, Bill C-150, um, the bill that supposedly decriminalised homosexuality, it just decriminalised certain acts amongst people over 21. But I did an intergenerational oral history throughout Surrey on that, so that one was up there. So city staff are fantastic. They are help us develop, and you're an example of that, Stacey. Every time we work, I approach staff in Parks, Recs and Culture or in any other place, we get a fantastic response. So in that sense, those barriers are gone. But other barriers remain. And I'm going to wish to shut up now and let Alex come in. Sure, Alex, the floor is yours. OK, after the president or the president, I believe, the Sikh temple in Syria said there's no such thing as gay Sikhs. About 10 years later, another board member of the Sikh temple, the same Sikh temple reached out to me and said, Alex, I realize we may not understand each other or we may not have a full understanding of you know, your community. However, can we work together to reduce HIV and STDs? Can we work together to reduce suicidal ideation, depression, um, can we work together to keep our community safe? And I actually even delivered a speech on mental health on a Sunday during a packed congregation um, on mental health and issues, you know, in our community, you know, at the Sikh temple in Surrey. And so that was a big, big movement forward for us. And what happened, uh, you know, like three or four years ago, the president of the, no, the outreach, outreach coordinator, board member of the Casa Dewan Society in Vancouver, uh, he reached out to me and invited Share Vancouver, from, you know, Surrey Delta based organization to march in the Vancouver Visaki parade. And when we marched, there was 20 of us, 25 of us wearing our share shirts. We actually made history around the world. We were one of the first, um, uh, queer, queer, you know, Sikh South Asian organizations 
you know, in the world to march um, in such a parade like that. We're not aware of any other one. We definitely were the first to march in the Vancouver Visaki Parade. So that was kind of a big, I know that that news went to the Hindustan Times and the Times of India and all, and you know, a lot of CBC news and a lot of different news all over the place. And so that was a big milestone for us. Like we're just, a, you know, a, a small to modest group in Surrey and that's what's happening. I like what, you know, Jen said about the staff at the city of Surrey and, uh, you know, the politics, Martin has a better idea about the politics. I don't really get involved in the politics, but uh, I, you know, the staff over the last five years has funded Share Vancouver almost every year for our film projects and for our peer support groups for different projects that we have started. The city of Surrey has done that. Those recommendations have gone to council and council has approved that, you know, just a staff recommendation. And, um, you know, so they have funded uh, My Name Was January and Emergence Out of Earth Shadows, both our films. And most recently, you know, we started a, a, the Share Vancouver podcast. We have about nine, 10 episodes completed. And we are now getting awareness on queer and BIPOC issues around the world. The podcast is very popular. And you're finally hearing the lived experience and stories of people in Surrey, Delta, Metro Vancouver, who are South Asian and queer and BIPOC. You're hearing their lived experiences and we're on the airwaves and we're getting out there, not only through film, but now also on streaming sites and on podcasts. So we're trying to do what we can to reach everyone, especially the younger generation who uses these types of uh, platforms. Well, thank you, Alex. I also wanted to ask you, could you confirm the date of when Share Vancouver first marched in the Vancouver Pride Parade? We marched in our very first year in April, to, well, in 2008, I believe the Pride Parade is end of July, August. So um, I'm not sure what exact date it was in 2008, but it was the end of July and August. And we had our first Pride of Bollywood float. We made history as the first queer Sikh float at that time in the Pride of in the Vancouver Pride Parade. And now we're gonna have our seventh Pride of Bollywood float in the parade this year. Excellent, congratulations. Um, Martin, I see you have something to add. Yes, I want to uh, reaffirm Jen's and Alex's reference to city staff um, who have been very proactive uh, in working with the LGBTQ2S community here in Surrey. Um, we got a major grant for the festival this year, way above and beyond what we have received before. Uh, Parks and Rec are incredible. Um, the pride flag was flown in after Pulse. And they did it exactly as we requested in 2014. Now go back to 2010 when we were one of the host cities of the Olympic Games or the Winter Games. They flew the Olympic flag on the same flagpole as the city flag underneath the city flag. So that was the argument that we made to council in 2014 in support of our LGBTQ athletes in Sochi for the Winter Games. Every other city around us flew the pride flag in support of those athletes. The city of Surrey at that point in time, or the council, I should say, at that point in time, made the protocol decision based on, and you can go to the records on City Hall in the meetings for this, based on the argument that the pride community asked for the pride flag to be flown on the pole and that if they accepted the pride community's request then they would be unable to refuse any other request of any other community um, for symbolic purposes and we in that argument which ironically doug mccollum is going to read in this year's proclamation is that the pride flag, like the Olympic flag, represents diversity, which is a true Canadian value. So that was the argument we made. Um, following the uh, Pulse massacre, because Vera LaFranc was on the council, the flag was raised uh, underneath the city flag, and the city plaza was lit up in pride lights. And the city 
the council seems to think that the plaza, which is unaccessible to most people, uh, lit up in pride, in pride colors is a, a, a true reflection of the diversity of the city. Um, I think so that, 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 that that's, you know, solves the issue. Going back to Alex's argument about somebody jumping off the bridge, the argument that we made in 2014 was if it saved the life of one LGBTQ2S person to fly the flag for even one day in the month of June, and it saved one life, then would that not be worth it? Because at that time, I'm not so sure Alex was the person or the person that Alex knows was the one that, that, that jumped off the bridge. At that point in time, there were many people taking their lives by suicide, which to me makes, you know, I understand that we lost our transgender secretary, um, our treasurer, sorry, two years ago uh, during COVID due to uh, internal bullying inside of the family and the misassignment purposely of pronouns. So they took their own lives uh, in a planned party and, and you know, we've no control over that. Um, so it's not, when we talk about this, when I talk about the city, it's not the staff inside the city that I am complaining about because clearly this year particularly, the city has made an extraordinary effort to embrace the LGBTQS community with UV archives, with the museum, uh, and with the grant that we were given by the city. But, and, oh, and the other thing I'd like to mention is that Linda Hepner and I created the Pride Crosswalk. Um, she was fascinated by the rainbow crosswalks in New Westminster. And when I met with her in her office, and I know this is on record and, 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 and that's okay. She looked at me and she said, how do I get a pride cross, a rainbow crosswalk in this city? And I said, very simply, Madam Mayor, you declare it. You defund it and you put it wherever we agree on. So at that point in time, we were still in Holland Park. So the, the, clearly the, the, the space to do it was on uh, Old Yale Road and, and on Holland Park. So she did, she, she did that, and, and, and I was very proud of her for actually having done that. So there are things that move forward. Now, had LRT come into play, should she have managed to pull that off? There was a conversation that one of the downtown Wally um, stations will be called either Rainbow Station or Pride Central. So there was an ongoing conversation about the de further development of the LGBTQ community and a recognition of it. However, as I said, you know, sometimes in politics, whoever comes into power undoes everything that the previous administration does just because they can. And, and so, so there are very, very positive steps that have been made, um, but the momentum has gotten lost by um, the fact that we only have 32% turnout in, in, in a municipal election. And 16% of that creates a mandate. Um, we need to, and we will, Surrey Pride is going to host um, a virtual meeting of the mayoral candidates, or at least invite all of them to the table to have a conversation about LGBTQ issues uh, in September. And we're finally, be, we decided that we're going to become active and engaged in, in the community that we live in. So, I don't know, you know, there, there have been major positives, um, but, but right now I, I think we're stuck and, and until this election is over and, and, and we get a new administration. Thank you, Martin. So we've talked about the political landscape, uh, the religious landscape across Surrey, but I also want to talk about the geographic landscape of Surrey. Um, you know, as many of us in the city know, there's so many of these town centers uh, that very much have their own communities. Um, and Surrey is a huge city. So I'm going to ask all of you to um, please talk about from your perspective, what locations in Surrey really stand out as important to the local LGBTQ2S plus communities development 
um, to their history or their ongoing history. Jen. My answer to that question, Stacey, is none. Because there is no focus. I could say Newton because that's where Youth for a Change has worked out of. And before Youth for a Change, it was Surrey Youth Alliance. Um, so Newton's had a connection with youth activism through our partnership with um, Pacific Community Resource Society, who provide us with the venue. Um, we could say Wally because when we have managed to get venues, there were the Olympia Pizza in Wally, Flamingo Bar in Wally. We could say almost Brownsville with the Turf Bar, but these places are ephemeral. They don't last forever. They're not. There's no continuity. Um, there's no queer space whatsoever in Cloverdale or um, South Surrey. Ha uh, Crescent Beach. You could Alex House, Alexander House, has a focus for intergenerational LGBTQ work, um, and. There is now a move afoot with there's a conversation happening in the city right now with that Martin and I are connected into, but that Alex House is connected into, that some Fraser Health people and some others. So there's some conversation now about can we seed fund a, a venue? And when we can do that, that's when the, that's when we'll be able to say this is the hub for LGBTQ in Surrey and this is a, a foundational and important place. Until then, we can't really answer that question unless Alex is going to contradict me. Absolutely. Alex, the floor is yours. So, you know, many, many years ago, I don't even remember, I wrote an article, an op-ed for the Georgia Strait, which was uh, about uh, the city of Surrey establishing an LGBTQ co committee, not a diversity committee, an LGBTQ committee, just like the city of Vancouver has. And I asked them to develop a strategic plan, a strategic plan about developing LGBTQ infrastructure in the city. This was, if you go onto the Georgia Street website, you can find the article. It was published five, six, seven years ago. And um, I said, you know, we need to have a plan to support the five to 10% of the population in Syria that is queer. That is not a nominal amount. We have a thousand new people moving to the city every month and they're all different backgrounds and a lot of them are queer. Where are they gonna go? And like, you know, like Martin and Jennifer says, they don't even have a resource center. We have. I, I don't I don't have anything against seniors, but we have a seniors center in every community. We have, you know, youth centers and senior centers that you what we don't even have one center for LGBTQ people for a city that's approaching half a million. I don't even know if it's bigger than half a million yet, for literally for half a million people. And if it's five to ten percent of the population that is queer, that's fifty to a hundred thousand people in this. Or am I right? No, no, no. Uh, maybe um, 25,000 people, that's queer. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know my math. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jen, for adding those um, resources for you for a change into the chat. I do want to remember or to remind everyone in the chat tonight that you are welcome to ask any questions at all. Please feel free to submit them. Um, Yes, Martin, I see you've got your hand up. Uh, uh, hang on, let me, there we go. I, I, want to, I want to back up Alex and Jen. So for the last 20 years, 25 years, I have been pleading for an LGBTQ center in, in at least Wally, because that's what I consider downtown. Uh, I've lived in, in Wally for almost 22 years. Uh, I lived in Fleetwood when we first moved out to Surrey, which was ALR land. And, and that's where, that's where the first pride dance was ever held right on 82nd Avenue and 160th street, right in the boonies, um, of what was then Surrey. Um, we've been pleading and, and I agree, Alex, I have pleaded when we had friendly council members to set up an LGBTQ um, committee. Forget about diversity, because to me, diversity is um, 
uh, for the purposes of elections, um, um, more about race than it is about diversity. Um, we, as a community, have yet to be invited to participate officially in any city hosted event in 25 years. So I don't know whether that's Parks and Rec or whether that's council or whatever. Um, but as Jen said, we are in discussions right now and, and I've had side discussions and I've interviewed each of the mayoral candidates that are currently um, claiming their run. And, and I'm trying to figure out where LGBTQ stands with those because as a Surrey Pride Society, we're not allowed to endorse. Uh, oh, by the way, Jen, the population of Surrey is about 700,000 right now. Um, uh, we're going to outdo, outmaneuver Vancouver in two years, probably at the rate of influx of people. Um, so what I've been trying to do is to find out who or what platform is going to incorporate LGBTQ. 7% um, and I sat down with Sue Hamill when I ran for City Hall. 7% of the population is assumed to be on the specter of LGBTQ BIPOC, um, which is a massive voting block if we were ever to get it together. The issue with inside our own community is that we tend to push certain elements of the community aside. And if the community combined um, on race, on sexuality, on orientation, uh, we're not monolithic, but I think that we're segregating ourselves based on sexual preference rather than individual relationships. And I think when we realize that, um, and I'm speaking as a, as a gay male, uh, uh, not necessarily representing, um, you know, 50% of the LGBTQ community, but I don't look at somebody at 62 years of age as somebody I want to go to bed with. I look at somebody as an individual, regardless of how they present themselves, whatever their background history is, um, and, and we need to get past as a community that judgment factor about color, sexual identity, or orientation. And, and to me, when we as a community get to that point, which um, uh, will probably be a, quite a while, um, because there is no dialogue within the community about that, um, but we are a major force if we if we combined all of our talents and all of our dollars and all of our influence to to make the change that we are talking about wanting to have. Thank you, Martin. We we only have about twenty five more minutes here to cover quite a lot of ground. Um, so I do want to encourage everyone to keep your answers um, concise because we have a lot of information we want to fit into 25 minutes. Uh, we do have a question that came through. Alex, would you be able to share where people can find the Share Vancouver podcast? Yeah, so just Google, just Google Share Vancouver podcast, three words, S-H-E-R for share. And all the episodes are live on the website. I think there's eight or nine episodes. There's also links to other resources to get help if you want. Um, it's a wonderful podcast. Two queer South Asian women who are both board members and sure, sure Vancouver have started that podcast. Um, actually, ironically, the City of Vancouver Cultural Services is partially funding that. And so is uh, TELUS. So, we are finally getting some support in the community. People are um, donating to us since we became a charity. And um, it's, a, it's just really a wonderful, and the good thing about a podcast is they last forever. Their stories will live forever. It's like a library, you know, it's like a book and it just lasts forever. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful resource we're creating for the community in real time of real lived experience. Thank you so much, Alex. So yes, please do check out the podcast. 
Uh, I know that um, there's actually another question that's quite brilliant in the chat, and we're going to weave that towards our concluding question. Right now, we we have discussed um, quite a bit about um, the influence of religion and race and gender. Um, I want to bring us back to that question and begin with you, Alex. Do you have anything else that um, you want to mention on that topic, particularly relating to the South Asian community um, and the Sikh religion that we haven't um, given you a chance to express mm -hmm. just yet? So what I would say as a Punjabi Sikh gay man, there's always been a lot of pressure on me to get married and have children and live a heterosexual life and bring home the daughter-in-law. And, you know, Martin was right when he mentioned that a lot of uh, South Asian and Punjabi Sikh families live with their extended families. They live with their grandparents, they live with their grandchildren, they live with their siblings sometimes, you know. So how does a same-sex couple or two gay men or uh, lesbian, how do they fit into that model and how do they have children and all that. I, I know when I told my mother that I was gay, she went through her own struggle and coming out journey because she was wondering, well, what does that mean for me? How are we going to have a family? How are you going to have children? How are you going to, um, you know, what does that mean for our community? You're shaming our community. This is not something that is normal as part of our culture and our tradition. So there's a lot of internalized issues of racism um, that people have to deal with. They feel like, you know, for the longest time, some people in our community say, I didn't realize you can be Sikh and be gay. And now I feel good that I can be both. But for a lot of young people, um, they, you know, that, that is something they have to come to terms with. Just like in the, in the Christian faith, you know, a lot of people feel rejected by their own faith. And they, it, it takes them a while to understand that, yes, you can be Christian and you know, I, you know, Jesus never said anything bad about gay people. I don't know why they always use the Bible to bash us, but he never actually said anything bad about gay people. And um, so, uh, so that's a little bit of some of the issues. There's a lot of other issues as well, but um, that gives you a little bit of an idea. Um, the other thing that which is very important is um, gay people that are South Asian or Punjabi and Sikh have no role models. We don't see ourselves represented or visible in the gay community or in the mainstream community. We are marginalized within our own South Asian Punjabi Sikh community. And then a lot of times we're marginalized into the margins within the queer community and the broad society. So there is an intersectional oppression and discrimination that we all face that we have to deal with. And for example, you know, I talk about in my film Emergence, and one of the reasons we do the podcast and we do the films, the filmmaking is to create this visibility and these role models. And I talk about that, you know, as a 50 year old man who's kind of heavy set and bald and, you know, um, you know, I don't look like the young, smooth, Caucasian, white, hot model guy that everyone, everyone seems to want, you know, it's hard for me to fit into the community, you know. But the sad thing is I'm so used to being on the margins now and not fitting in that one of the, that I'm just used to it. And the one that's one of the reasons we wanted to create these safe spaces and share Vancouver so people can feel safe and we can save lives. We haven't talked much about the role that gender plays in community experience. So Jen, the floor is yours. I think Martin alluded a little bit to that when he said we're divided even amongst ourselves. So this idea that, oh, there's gay men in that corner and lesbians in others. Um, Martin and I have worked very closely together for years on a number of projects. That's so that comes there. Um, but um, you asked about, you know, representing a diverse range of people's stories in our recording of archives and history. I think that is vitally important because we have, even in the gay community, we have seen certain stories such as the Stonewall riots being whitewashed and being taken away from the um, drag queens and to the more respectable gay community. Those people who are, well, people people will look at me and say, well, you're a respectable professor. Um, we have to ensure that people who are more marginalised within our community, we are making sure their voices are projected rather than... Um, so I want to put a plug in here. Um, under the banner of Surrey Pride, I have been working with City of Surrey Libraries, as you know, Stacey, because you've provided some of the archive material. There is a three-month-long history of 
Pride in Surrey exhibit at Museum of Surrey. It will, it's open now and it'll be there until September. And one of the things I made absolutely sure about in there was, but this wasn't just the history of the Surrey Pride Society. It was the history of Cher Vancouver. But so my Alex, some of your exhibits are in there. It was, um, it, you know, Youth for a Change, IPAMA, making sure that the organisations, at least in this city, can be included in that. So make people ask questions and say, oh, I want to know more about that. Um, and as, Ma as um, Alex mentioned, we cannot work as, we must not write our histories as though people were only one identity. We have to go through the complexities of the intersectionality of their identities. So history, but not, um, I, for me, it's very important as well. I know that there are different um, evolution stories about Surrey Pride in this city. So a few years ago, I um, invited any Surrey person who wished to come and speak and say, this is my history. This is why I, I remember it happening. These are oral history videos that um, some of them are currently with City of Surrey archives. The, the, the big picture is to let people speak with their own words and their own memories, their own stories. And um, I pondered for years as to whether I should put this into SFU archives. And I thought, no, these stories belong in this city. And so thank you, Stacey, and your colleagues for saying that you will work with me to create an oral, uh, a video oral history archive in partnership with archives. So I think that's why all the stories are important. And you wanted me to address gender. I see this, um, so after almost 50 years of working with youth in Surrey, we used to work with the majority of the youth that would come to us would identify as lesbian or gay or maybe bisexual. That population seems to be better served with other things going on now, and so it's not such a desperate need. But the youth that we have been seeing coming into our organisation are youth who are exploring who they are in terms of their gender, not their biological sex, but who they feel themselves to be. So there's an over-representation in our group just now of youth who identifies trans and non-binary. Um, so I think that that's a shift that I am watching. And you know, we just need to remember that gender is who you are, not what your biology is. Absolutely, thank you, Jen. And thank you as well for touching on the importance of oral history, certainly working in archives it's hearing people speak about their own experiences is an incredibly invaluable historical record. Um, you know what, Martin, I know you've had your hand up for a while and then we'll come back to you, Alex. Um, Martin, the floor is yours. So, so you know, I listened to Alex and I, I, and I listened to Jen. And Alex's experience in, in, in his um, life experience is no different than those of us that grew up in uh, a restrictive and right-wing quote Christian scenario. And I think what we have to find and agree upon is that we have shared experiences regardless of background and race and ethnicity. And, and I appreciate it, Alex, what you brought to the table because I have a similar experience as I was growing up in in Ireland, and I think, unfortunately, um, a lot of people are experiencing the same discrimination today, regardless of, of race. And and I also am 62, and I'm not like 25, and 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 I'm not as attractive as I once used to be. But I I passed that, you know. I, I'm fortunate enough to have a partner. Um, and and Jen, um, I love the way Jen has worked to create a trust with the youth. But today's youth don't understand all the battles that we have fought for them to be able to identify as who they are today. And there was a question about youth earlier in, in the, the thing. And, and I believe Jen and I's goal, and I think Alex's goal too, is to create an environment where youth that want to be engaged in in moving forward have that opportunity because quite frankly after 25 years of living a public life i'm hoping that we've created the space where where some of these youth will will stand up and fight and and fight in public 
uh, and go to city halls and, and go to rallies for what they deem to be, um, yeah, no kidding, Jack. <laughs> That's the truth. Um, um, but I hope we've created the space where the younger generation um, feels comfortable enough to step forward and continue the battle. Because certainly in today's political environment, um, the majority of youth don't tend to vote and don't, intend, don't tend to be politically aware because they have access to this, which we never had access to. Um, they're extremely internet savvy, but their physical participation in the community, from what I can see, is extremely limited. And they need to be more physically in, involved. Yes, Jen, uh, the, the Youth for Change will be hosting a vo voting registration um, um, tent at, at Surrey Pride. Um, but we're hoping that we can, what we've learned and our experiences, and the fight is not over by any stretch of the imagination, until the flag flies in our city, until the LGBTQ community is invited to forums, or 4A, or whatever the, the, the plural of that is, um, we, are not, we are not equal, regardless of skin color, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of gender, regardless of orientation. There's a whole community out there that needs to rise up and say, we are here. And we do not accept the current uh, authority quote, unquote, that has been imposed upon us. Uh, thank you, Martin. We've got about 10 minutes left um, and one more question to wrap up. But before we get into that last question, Alex, um, please let us know what you have to add. I just quickly wanted to mention something about uh, transgender people, because I don't think we touched a lot about trans people in this discussion so far. So. Um, until I met my friend January, I didn't know a lot about transgender people and their challenges, and I was kind of ignorant, to be honest. And then when she was murdered, um, I mean, I didn't even consider January transgender. She was just a human being and a friend. I, you know, she happened to be transgender, but she was just my friend. And, and then when she was murdered, and then my name was January, our first short documentary came out, and we did her story. All of a sudden, this, this huge demographic of anti-trans people were attacking me. And they were like, why did, who am I to make a trans film? Why am I promoting trans this or trans that? Or, you know, bringing it into schools and, you know, January happened to work as a sex worker and there's, and they were saying I was promoting sex work in schools and I was promoting trans rights and all this kind of stuff. And then I, then I got a taste. Then I got a taste of how much discrimination and oppression and marginalization and alienization trans people face in our community. And then, um, and then I, um, and then, you know, so this is, I just wanted to mention that, you know, just so, so it's included in our discussion that we cannot forget the trans community as part of the queer community. And we have to remember, this is, seems to get be getting worse. It seems to be getting worse, the discrimination that trans people face, even from some quarters of the queer community, um, is really, really getting worse, I find. And, and, you know, I know because I created a film on a trans woman who was murdered, and I got a, I got a backlash on that. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much for adding that to the record that we have tonight. It's an extremely important part of um, where the LGBTQ2S plus community and our society is at today. Um, I'm going to attempt here to wrap up our discussion tonight by combining two questions um, that cover the same theme. So we have a question in the chat about um, how the advocacy that you've done has opened doors for the younger generation. Um, and another question that I want to tie into that is the role that history plays in building acceptance and inclusion of the LGBTQ2S plus um, community in Surrey um, and how you want to see that history represented in the future for future generations. So Jen, I see your hand raised. You are free to tackle this question first. 
OK, so I'm the history nerd and I'm the one that does the history displays in Surrey. All the ones in the City Hall atrium, the current one in the museum. And I do this not and I, you know, the oh, my oral, intergenerational oral history project. I do this because I do feel that um, we need to be represented. The work that we do needs to be represented. But I also have a passion for ensuring people know what important things have come out of this city. So we've already spoken about James Chamberlain changing national law in Canada, setting national precedent in Canada. Well, there's a man sitting on this panel who's changed international law. And I think it's vitally important that people don't just remember Martin Rooney. Oh, yeah, he was really active as president of Surrey Pride. He put on some fantastic festivals. Martin, the HIV travel ban, do you want that is right in there as a big part of our history display. And I will, it's your story to tell. So, um, um, Stacey, might we let Martin say a little bit about that? A hundred percent. Go for it, Martin. So in 2007, Remembrance Day, we headed to the United States to do shopping because the dollar was fabulous at the exchange rate. I got stopped at the border and was accused of knowingly entering the United States as somebody living with HIV. Uh, I was interrogated for three hours at the, at the truck crossing and fingerprinted and run through the FBI most wanted list and was sent home to Canada being told never to enter the United States again. So I got home and I was very upset and I thought, you know, this really puts, puts a target on me and those people who lived with HIV. So the next 24 hours later, I had Global TV sitting in my basement and interviewing me. And the interviewer said to me, do you realize that this ban, if a 9-11 ever happened again and you were on a plane and it landed in the United States, you'd be taken out and put into prison? And I said, no. And, and you got to remember earlier on, I suggested that my family all lived in Ireland. So to travel anywhere at that point in time internationally, you have to go through some US point or over some US airspace. So I rallied a whole bunch of people um, both local politics, federal politics, uh, provincial politics, and the international court system, which I was a part of. And we rallied against the travel ban, had multiple rallies throughout Canada, the United States, and actually worldwide. There was one day of worldwide activity where um, all people were recommended to go to the U.S. Embassy throughout the, uh, throughout the world and filed their complaint to um, the Department of Health, um, which had a, a, a open space. And uh, South Africa, Brazil, Europe, they all um, um, ended up submitting their objection to it. And we had rallies on both sides of the border in Buffalo and in, in Toronto. I had one here at the Peace Arts. And all of the politicians spoke against, um, and this is another form of inequity that exists within our community. And the fact that monkeypox has now been trying to be defined politically as like HIV, as a gay disease. So here we go again, the trauma and the PTSD of all, anyway, bottom line to all of this was successfully we overturned the travel ban. I was the first person in Canada, if not the world, to enter the United States as a person with HIV legally, with a letter from the White House telling me I could enter the United States with CBC in my car on the radio and CBC television on the other side of the border waiting for me to cross over. And that to me, I mean, it gives me goosebumps talking about it now, I don't claim credit for it, but that was a huge, huge, huge change that affected millions and millions and if not billions of people in the world. Thank you, Jen, for bringing that up. Thank you, Jen, for acknowledging it. I tend to, to put that somewhere, you know, to the side. However, every time Jen has done uh, a history of, of Surrey LGBTQ issues, I've, she's always included that as one of the primary um, uh, changes that, that somebody in Surrey made worldwide. And that's not to take away from anything anybody else has done. I had a lot of support. And as Alex said, I have connections in politics. 
and politics is in my DNA. So <laughs> anyway, um, that's the history of brief history of the HIV travel ban that the United States had imposed on everybody, actually going back to the Reagan era. And it was implemented by law during the Clinton uh, White House administration. It's no longer exists. January 4, 2010, it was lifted. And I had now have a Nexus pass and I can go over and back and do my do my good deeds in, in the United States and Mexico, which I was doing before that. But thank you, Martin, for adding that to this record. Um, Alex, I, I'm going to turn things over to you now. Is there anything you wanted to add about the way that uh, the history of the community should be portrayed in the future? Well, first of all, it's so inspiring to hear that story from Martin. Uh, I didn't know the full story, so uh, that is such a great uh, service to uh, you know, so many people and really, and HIV people are also very marginal. People who with HIV are also very marginalized and were discriminated against in all communities, really, especially when HIV first broke. Um, the question was, is there my, my message, my message to the community? Yeah, my, yeah, my message to the community is, you know, Listen, be supportive, be kind. If someone is coming out to you, be a friend because you may be the last person they have that's a barrier in their mind that they can reach out to that'll save their life and prevent them from hurting themselves or harming themselves. You, they are trusting you. They are trusting you to, to share, their, to share their, their struggle with their sexuality or their gender identity. And, you know, if you can't do anything to help someone, don't say or do anything to harm someone. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I know working in the archives profession, we often look at our collections and whether or not they're reflective of real history. And so, of course, we can assume that members of the LGBTQ2S plus community have always been a part of Surrey's story from the very beginning, predating the municipality. Um, but to actually have that documented is a completely different story. Uh, so I want to thank all three of you for your fantastic contributions this evening. I want to also, um, of course, acknowledge our audience for the fabulous questions that they submitted. I'm going to ask all of you um, who are attending to please hold on for a second. I'll be ending our recording shortly, and then we're going to be hearing about some of the uh, upcoming events held by Surrey Pride, as well as um, Alex's new movie, um, which is Emergence Out of the Shadows. But just one moment. <laughs> 